Hey all, this is going to be a review of, let me try to get it out of the blur, before we, oh come on camera, work with me, before we go live, which has some lovely front art that I don't want to end up missed, there we go, Navigating the Abusive World of Online Entertainment by Stephen Flavel, I will have a link down in the description to go ahead and I think it's purchasable at this stage, I was fortunate enough to get a pre, um, pre-release version, thank you, uh, Stephen Flavel aka Jorbs, he's a friend of the channel, and I recommend checking out his Twitch channel as well as his YouTube channel for a variety of content. Um, I want to preface that this is a review, but it is also a rant on my part because a lot of the material that he covers in this book has also been on my mind as well. Um, and I really want to provide a frame of mind, which I think is important regarding the conversations that I hope this book provokes. Um, for the people that are unfamiliar with me, uh, in the spirit of this book, I'm not going to go listing a bunch of accolades. Um, I will say I feel like for my capabilities I have hit above my belt as far as being able to make an impact in the Twitch community and the communities that I've been a part of. Um, but uh, I'll say I've been around in Twitch as both a contributor and a consumer since the beginning, since it was Justin TV. And in that time I've really enjoyed watching it transform and grow. Um, in particular interest I've noticed that, it, and this is just kind of inherent, it's tied into the essence of Twitch is a community formation. I feel like not just in this space, in any space, it, there's something really interesting, compelling to me about the things that bring people together. It's magical, really. And I think it's a worthwhile endeavor, although it does come with its traumas, which I think is um, a degree of subject of the book. Uh, a great example of what I'm talking about is for people that were around when it was happening, Twitch plays Pokemon, where it seemed like there was an entire mythology that was spawning in real time before our eyes, chaos be praised. Um, Anyway, in the space of all that, I feel a bit like an archivist or a grandparent, and I, even though I haven't been able to share a lot of those stories, um, but I've still been kind of embedded in the midst of it in an oblique way. So I, I've been privileged as well to know a lot of people that I knew them before they made it big, or I was uh, with them when they were still just whoever they were, uh, normal. Their names weren't across the internet. They weren't ho household or I guess internet hold uh, names. And I've, um, for a number of people. And what's interesting is, is I like to create a dichotomy in my brain of the interaction I had with them before. And then occasionally I try to have lunch with them and things like that afterwards. And it's funny when I've, with more than one of them, I've been like, hey, let's go out to lunch and things like that. And I feel like it takes a while, but they're pleasantly surprised that I'm not, um, that my primary interest is just checking in on them and seeing how they're doing and doing a bit of reminiscing. Cause I feel like there's almost an expectation of a demand or, hey, put your time and energy into this, or hey, let's talk about branding or something like that. Um, but I think that to me really shows the transformation that individuals go through when they're in this space is just you end up inundated in it. There's a substance of something and I think it's endemic. I think it's part of the human experience really. And I don't know all of the mechanisms of it. I think there's different mechanisms for different people. I think for some it's a mechanism of approval and for others people want to be part of something bigger and for others um not sure what it is <coughs> just wanting a friendship or security or something like that but i will say if you hop into a twitch chat if you're there for a very short period of time you almost automatically know how you should behave in that channel and there's something about that that's also in the spaces of all this and i think it's important to be aware of the internal need or the internal drive there is for whatever it is that causes us to drive towards these communal spaces and how we behave in the space of it. Because it's almost as if, um, I almost want to say there's kind of like a meta factor if you like step back. There is an individual, you put them into an environment and there's certain behavior that ends up being generated out of that. Um, and that can be for the positive or for the negative. Um, that will come and just, just keep that sort of concept in mind. Uh, as I go through this, because I think it's important to the book and important to the conversations that follow, I guess, because, um, yeah, I think a large portion of this book is about, it's a listing of trauma, honestly. Um, and there's some people I'll say that they have absolutely thrived while they've made that transition into, uh, being something bigger than they are. Um, but by and large, I will say for everybody involved, it's a traumatic experience. Um, yeah, I would say the book, I wanted to say salacious, but that's not the right word. Um, it's a challenging read, I'll say. It's it's a challenging read at times. Potentially you could say it's a love story, but I would say that essentially what it is, is it's really a uh, an important documentation of grappling with trauma. I actually had an, it, it's kind of odd 
for me in particular because I was consuming a lot of the con I, as far as what he is descript uh, describing in the book I was actually watching his channel through a lot of these periods of time and I remember him mentioning offhand a lot of the events in this book I just didn't know the what background was happening um, yeah and I also want to just note it at large for every individual not just content creators like everyone everyone that uh it's something i've seen in my own life and in the life of others which is kind of a repeated pattern of trauma both in spaces that we enter into um and basically it almost feels like we end up facing that same trauma again and again and again almost subconsciously i talk about this in psycho in psychology circles but <clears throat> i'm gonna make the blunt metaphor jorbs didn't make this blunt metaphor maybe because he's tired of slave spire i don't know um but uh, if I, Jorbs, I think, is most well known for his Slay the Spire content. Um, and I also, uh, making that as like a side metaphor, I oftentimes think that if we look at the Spire as our own personal trauma or co our collective trauma, I feel like we're doomed to repeat the same pattern over and over again until we recognize it and incorporate it or heal it or overcome it, basically. Um, and, so, and I feel like this book is a great corner piece, a great launching off point to start addressing uh, collective and individual traumas that people have had in the content creator community and all, as both um, and to work through it basically as both content creators and as viewers. Um, it's an incredibly vulnerable book. It's extremely eye-opening uh, for everyone, I think. And it really, I think it highlights what I'll say are um, transformational rifts on very ancient problems. Um, when I was initially trying to think about how I wanted to talk about this review, I wanted to say that celebrity is not a, is a new concept. That um, it's something that, <coughs> excuse me, was given rise in the age of radio and was accelerated by the invention of the television and again, accelerated by the internet. Um, I don't think that's the case anymore. Mostly because if you look at history, there's been a long tradition of village, uh, of village leaders, of religious leaders, of shamans, of gurus, um, and so it seems like it's something inherent to humanity for whatever reason. And for, and I don't know what the reasons are for the selecting process entirely, as far as why we decide certain individuals are above or have whatever that special status is. It seems some, in some instances, it seems linked to privilege, like kingship, things like that. And, that, and this isn't me also saying that hard work isn't involved. What I'm saying is, is if you look at Jorbs objectively, a lot of everybody, uh, well, not everybody, the majority of people are, are drawn to him because of his strategic play in many games, but in particular with Slay the Spire. And it's a digital card game that doesn't really have a massive impact on the world at large. And uh, kind of the decision to push Jorbs into the special status, if you just take like an object or anyone really, this isn't just Jorbs, it's anybody, it oftentimes just feels very arbitrary, um, which creates a lot of cognitive dissonance, I'll say, with content creators, myself included, because there's something that happens in the process of people achieving whatever that status is, I don't have a word for it, uh, where people cease to end up being human. Where um, And also, it's almost the individuals that are engaging in the thing cease to be human as well. I was actually discussing this uh, briefly uh, with Jorbs, actually, because I was saying, hey, do you mind if I do a review? Uh, but there is a certain stage where chat is no longer individuals it's chat it's like this anomalous blob of individuals and something happens in that stage as well where it feels like the collective it, it feels like there's an amping up of energy it's like where it, i almost think of it as sound waves where the positive and the negative get amplified um yeah and that can be for the positive or for the negative really um and I'm part of me wants to, and this is just me speculating on certain things. I almost wonder if part of that process as well is as far as the individuals looking to other people and kind of having, there's this energy in it. I don't know how to describe it, but that's what I want everybody, the content creators and the viewers, everybody to be aware of is that something in us that wants to loft our hopes and our dreams on someone else. And I think oftentimes I've been in this place where uh, the content creators or the people who are engaging in it, it's we don't have the answers per se, or we're not sure that we can meet the, de the demands and the needs of uh, what people are looking to us and is expecting of us. For my part, um, I don't mind taking a shot and trying. It's just, you know, leverage your, keep your expectations within space because I'm still human. That's what it comes down to. And I think oftentimes people end up getting treated 
as something other than human. And I'm wondering if it's maybe part of a developmental pattern with uh, childhood relations relating to, relating to like parents where it's like uh, your brain is in a space where it's like you have the parent. And so it's kind of the same sort of lofting of subconscious and internal needs to someone else uh, that happens. But anyway, that's uh, above my pay grade, I'll say. Um, there are two books actually I recommend reading up uh, reading up on either as a, hopefully the music isn't too loud in the background or maybe it's too quiet. Ah, it looks like actually it's decent volume here. <coughs> Excuse me. There are two books I recommend reading either in parallel or after this book. Uh, one is uh, on masculinity, which is touched on in the book. It's called um, Under, uh, Under, Sa uh, blah, blah, blah. Under Saturn's Shadow by James Hollis. Um, I feel like it's a bit dated, but it has still a good amount of information and probably still information that's re uh, relevant to a lot of men and male issues. The second is an absolutely remarkable thing by uh, Hank Green. In the latter book, Hank Green talks about the metaphor. He makes a metaphorical journey about this same sort of transformational process. And he comes to the conclusion that celebrity is inherently corrupting and destructive is uh, for the individuals and for everybody at large. I'm not sure I'm going to, to make that conclusion, mostly because it does seem like they're is just that pattern in human history. And part of it is, is um, I mean, we still see it today where people are put in that space of like, these are the important people to pay attention to. And you'll see it on the front page of Reddit and Twitter and Imager, wherever you go, the newspaper. Um, people are put on pedestals, it seems like as just a general human thing and no longer precisely treated as human. And they're, they're, they're treated as um, almost symbols or infallible leaders. I'm not sure I necessarily want to say destroy that. Mostly I want to say, can we utilize that? Can we transform that internal thing that is endemic to humanity uh, into something positive? Where we just don't, um, in particular, where we don't drop personal responsibility, but we uh, engage in personal responsibility and where we do allow people to be leaders, but also recognize that uh, people are, we don't have, I don't have... 50 lifetimes um, worth of knowledge and experience to directly consciously access to be able to say what is right or what will work or what won't um, in the space of all of this is I guess what I'm saying. I can, I like bringing up thoughts like this, but as far as will this result in the thing I'm looking for, I'm not entirely sure yet. Mostly this is me trying to experiment to see if it does, um, which I'll get to kind of, um, I'm almost revealing the conclusion before I reveal the, the rest of it. Um, I want to talk about Jorb's Twitch channel in particular, and also uh, I'll say I'm maybe not the best person to be giving this review because I have a degree of bias when it comes to Jorb's because I like him as a person is what it comes down to. I've consumed a good amount of his content, and so I kind of have a warm friendliness towards him. But at the same time, I haven't met him in person. I don't. I haven't sat down and had a conversation. Um, I can't say that he's fr a friend, if that makes any sense, because we haven't interacted in that sort of personal way. But I will say this. I, I like Jorbs. I've gone through, I've seen a lot of Twitch channels. In fact, I'll say that um, <clears throat> I ended up finding, uh, talking about that earlier process of like going into a community and almost adapting to what its nature is. There, with Twitch channel creation, it does seem like there is a community that forms almost organically out of the personality that's in that community. Um, sometimes it's unconscious, sometimes it's a little bit more conscious. But uh, I've seen the entire range. I've seen people that have made communities that I would label as toxically positive, um, others that are appropriately positive. I've seen the precise opposite, uh, where I know an individual that has more or less turned, I'll, I don't know another way to say it, but he's basically monetized bullying in a humorous way. Um, check out Artosis if you, if you want to see that, which is kind of something special and unique as well. But I found Jorbs in the midst of the pandemic. Um, I had a friend that recommended Slay the Spire to me as a game, and then some content creators. I originally was in a Crimson Blur's channel, which I loved his channel, would love to see him stream again. I enjoyed his channel because he would indulge my inane statements. I would say things like, uh, for people that have played Slay the Spire, Orakalcum, I think Orakalcum's the least useful for silence, and he, and I think people would be like, why did he even say that? Like, how does that, anyway. But, um, I enjoy gaining a lot of wisdom by employing Cunningham's Law, and I feel like Blur allowed me to do a lot of that. Uh, and I enjoyed his, because he would have dismissal or whatnot. He, he'd wrestle with information internal to himself, be like, nah, that was dumb or whatever. 
And so it was kind of like, uh, I don't know, I enjoyed his engagement with chat and I felt like I learned a lot from it and just enjoyed the experience altogether. Um, Cause it was kind of jovial and didn't, um, it had drive without taking yourself too seriously, but this isn't about blur. When I came to George's channel, I expected that exact same sort of experience because I already had that same sort of patterning from another channel. And I think that's what happens in the Slay the Spare community at large is they've been in other channels where there's that sort of interaction. So they expect that sort of interaction when they come to George's because that's kind of like the pattern thing that you expect and you expect you enter in this space and so that there's this sort of expectation that Jorbs uh, really doesn't have any control over, which I think is a, a cause of a lot of frustration for him. Um, but I very quickly realized, because I ended up getting chastised um, for backseating, that the channel had a very different culture. Um, and really, there's something I saw out of Jorbs that I really have not seen out of any other channel creator or anyone since. I think he was the first person that I've ever seen on Twitch, period, that has asked the viewers to consider what it meant to be a good participant in the stream. And to, and that really hit me and really was a pause for reflection why I recommend this book, because I think he's asking, he's quietly asking the same thing in the contents of the book itself. Um, because coupled with that quiet demand is, uh, a demand to be treated like a human being, which I really appreciate and I think is very, very important, especially in in the technological era that we're in. Um, I'll say what I can glean of Jorbs as a person, I feel like he's attracted to Slay the Spire because in part it's a meditative practice for him. It's a simple enough game where you have block and you have damage and you're playing cards and whatnot, but it has an immense amount of com complexity that gives rise to nuance. Um, so there isn't such a thing as a good card or a bad card. There's just bad circumstances and bad use cases. Um, so basically Slay the Spire really puts people in a situation where they need to stop acting impulsively and try to create these categories and instead act thoughtfully. And I think he really enjoys that aspect of anything. And it really is something that he exudes, honestly, in my opinion, as a person, which uh, I think is also exuded in this book. And it's something that I just very much appreciate about him as a content creator. Um, and I want to say, reflecting on that and wrapping in the earlier things I said, uh, in Slay the Spire, there's different ascension levels ranging in difficulty. You have A20, which is currently the highest. But in the real world, metaphorically, we have A20 problems and we're being dumped in as complete neophytes and we have completely different card sets that were everybody's been dealt dealt a different set of cards um and collectively we're being asked to face those problems the the problem of celebrity in the new era uh amongst them and i i feel like the book really touches on a number of important ones i think that one being highlighted throughout the entirety of it from toxic masculinity to struggling business in a streaming space to ad revenue and the mismatch between companies being able to get value and people knowing and the content creators being able to to um, pro properly define value and get proper value for it. Uh, I do want to make a, and there's also honestly, as a result of that, I've seen it across four different, uh, this isn't in the space of esports because I don't think I would label Slay the Spire an esport, but I've seen it across four different sports and a myriad of uh, organizations from <coughs> Counter-Strike to StarCraft 1, uh, Brood War to StarCraft 2 to League of Legends. I've seen the exact same problem happen over and over and over again. Um, and it's caused damage psychologically to people, both, and it's caused damages to businesses and just trauma for everybody involved. I've, um, I'll say it actually PM'd this to George. I don't know Hannah personally, but I, uh, and I don't know that it would be psychologically healing for her to open up her own version of an F2K or something along those lines, but I will say it's direly needed. And uh, unfortunately, oftentimes what people demand of other people isn't necessarily what's healthy for them. So I kind of couch all of this in, if it's healthy for you, do X. But for, for Hannah or people like her, we need that in spaces. And I'll also say, as an odd thing, I don't know, maybe it's because there is kind of a, there's a, there's the capitalistic drive to not have to pay the amount it's worth or uh, an opposite be paid more than it's worth. And I think, and it's cloudy, there's a lot of smoke in the air. And unfortunately, I feel like what that does is it ends up rewarding narcissists and psychopaths to the point that I think people that aren't necessarily narcissists and psychopaths start trying to emulate narcissistic and psychopathic behavior. Um, that's something I've seen with people reading like the, uh, something that was mentioned was an individual picking up the 48 rules of power to read through it and apply it. And I feel like that's almost, 
if you actually like sit down and think about the resulting environment that you create by applying these rules, you'd be like, ah, this is dumb and I shouldn't be doing this in real life. But I feel like instead, uh, it's almost done as a, uh, oh, this is what should be done or this is what needs to be done or this is what will allow, this is what people psychologically are expecting. So I'll end up with benefit. And it and it's kind of like, again, that thing that's uh, anti the mentality of, uh, I'll say anti Jorbs mentality rather than anti Slate Aspire mentality of sitting and thinking about what we're doing and the results we're getting as far as the things we're implying. The impulsivity or almost the um, that same sort of drive where you end up in a thing and you don't stop and think about what you're doing and the damage that it uh, creates. I feel like that same mentality can be applied to all of the spaces that he touched in the book from toxic masculinity to the, again that uh, the streaming business problem to personal interaction to treat it, to how you treat yourself all of that. Um, and I think that is why this book is important. And the crux of it is, and honestly, the I think the essence that Jorb, Jorbs exudes and why so many people end up unfairly looking to him for answers, which is it asks us to stop and examine ourselves and how we reach our own personal goals and aims and how our behavior. And we also need to stop and look and how, look at how our behavior contributes to the problems of the world and how each of us has a particular worldview and our own set of cards and whatnot, and how we can either alleviate or increase that problem. A blunt metaphor is that in Slay the Spire, we have, we each have a spire we're trying to slay in our lives collectively and individually. But if we accept our strengths and weaknesses and face this problem, maybe we can best the spire. At which point, yeah, there'll be a new spire, but maybe we can best it again and again and again, or at least come up with new scenarios or things that we can give to the future generations so that they can tackle the same goals and, uh, and basically get past instead of repeating the same problems and traumas. Um, yeah, I think it's extremely important in this space as both a viewer and a content creator uh, for as anyone to stop and reflect and behave in ways that alleviate kind of that cold darkness for ourselves and as best as best we can try to alleviate it for others. And I feel like the title reflects it in this in this in a couple ways where it's before we go live, which is before we go live, recognize me as an individual, recognize the things I've gone through recognize me as a person before we go live. Also, if you're going into content creation, recognize that these are some of the problems that you're going to have to face, unfortunately. But also you could look at it as before we go live, which is stop and think about how we engage in this world and do it thoughtfully and try to do it in a way that, um, that creates something better. And I think I don't want to abandon content creation and I don't necessarily want to abandon celebrity. I think they, or whatever that is, I don't think celebrity encapsulates the entire concept of words. It's kind of the looking to someone for leadership or direction um, collectively. I don't know that those are things that necessarily should be tossed aside, but I feel like there are ways that we can do it better so that people are treated as human and that there are appropriate expectations and we're not just abandoning our personal responsibility uh, in that space. So it's like, I wanna keep the thing, I don't wanna abandon it, mostly because I'm stubborn, but also I just haven't seen evidence that, uh, I think it's useful and I don't, I haven't seen evidence that uh, it should be abandoned, I guess. And I'm stubborn, I guess, is the other aspect of it. I feel like it's something that can be conquered um, if we are willing to wade into the darkness and just look interior to ourselves. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't comment on Hannah. I don't know Hannah personally um, and it's, It'll be a bit antithetical to everything I've said up to this point, but <laughs> deal with it, I guess. So recognize that I'm doing it for a particular purpose. Um, I feel like there, I, I don't know Hannah, but I do know the Hannah archetype, the two Hannah archetypes, ironically. Um, I also want to side comment that I can't speak to the health of Jorbs and Hannah's relationship because I don't know either of them personally. I will say it looks like it's based on the mutual alleviation from the book. It looks like it's based on the mutual alleviation of healing and trauma which I think is the best foundation for any relationship or community that you can engage in. And I think that's honestly what, if I was going to say have an aim and have a goal, that should be the baseline. That should be the thing that we're trying to aim for uh, towards and having that thoughtful space um, of personal, like, okay, are, are we doing, how are we contributing to the problem or is, anyway, you get what I'm saying. Um, yeah rather than basically perpetuating the same trauma over and over again. And uh, I will say for individuals out there that haven't been in a number of relationships um, or in a lot of communities or haven't noticed a pattern in life, there's a certain stage of your life that I feel like I'm at where you sit back and you recognize that if you continue to behave subconsciously, you end up going into the same thing and repeating the same patterns over and over again. So look out for that. 
Um, and it's worth doing self-examination, I think, and being thoughtful so that you can find something and do something better and actually have some healing rather than kind of a repeat pattern. Anyway, I don't know Hannah, but I know the Hannah archetypes. I know on one side, the female or transgendered individual who is struggling in a male-dominated industry. And I know the other side, which is the quiet contributor driving real value and substance, but they're oftentimes going overlooked and being completely exploited. Sometimes, uh, oftentimes, the, that two archetypes are wrapped up in the same person. In fact, I can't think of an instance where that was not the case for uh, a woman I've known in the industry. Um, I want to comment first on the, and this is more me kind of doing a couple warnings. I want to comment on the Hannah, the behind the scenes person. You can measure the health and trajectory of any community, esports, whatever, based on how well those individuals are treated, how many opportunities they're given to grow, expand, etc. And the more opportunities they're given to grow and expand, the more things accelerate. And the more they're overlooked for the top line celebrities or whatever that people want to make the main focus, the more you'll see decline or something built on a house of cards and teetering and collapse. Um, and this is kind of why I wish, and this is again, well, I'll say it again. I wish people like Hannah would go or Hannah herself would start industries or get involved as leaders in the industry um, to create, because I think they are more aware. And I have seen some people do that actually. I do want to say that you have to be careful, particularly in any industry that's driven by passion, because oftentimes people will use, because that passion tends to be a blinder, people will use that uh, that same passion to be exploitative, for uh, lack of a better term. And I don't know what it is, whether it is because of that smoke that, I don't know if it's narcissists and psychopaths are attracted to the uh, to it, or it's again, it's like that pattern behavior, as I mentioned earlier, but I've seen a lot of that style of behavior in nearly, not in every organization, but in a number of the organizations, uh, either secondhand or firsthand accounts. Um, yeah. So I guess if you know someone who is in the field or in content creation and they're a normal human being, um, <coughs> be gentle with them because I'll, I'll say it's rough in gaming, in gaming, programming, any of it. Um, anyway. I wanted to get that one out of the way so I can talk about uh, the bigger one, which is the which, the more prevalent one, I think, which is the Hannah archetype of the female or the transgendered individual in a male-dominated industry. I've been blessed to know a number of women in this space and to call them my friends. And every single one of them is an exceptional person, and they have seen far less success than they deserve by a factor of, I don't know, 10 or 20. If you would flip, if you flip their genders and put them in the exact same circumstances, they would end up having 20 times the success in my opinion, um, across the board. And I think that's a travesty. I remember in the early days of Counter-Strike, just as voice chat was becoming a thing, I had a roommate who's a full on adult. He could drink alcohol and, uh, we hopped, we were in a server together and a girl hopped into the server we were playing in and it was like he was on the playground again as a kid. He literally said, OMG, a girl, and proceeded to chase her around and knife her like an idiot. And I, I literally turned around and used a couple expletives like, are you an idiot? Uh, which I'll save here for people that want to listen to this uh, with ch children around. I chastised him, but I don't know whether it's just something relegated to that, that's happening in society at large where there seems to be like a breakdown where men and women aren't able to treat each other as human because of lack of space where we can inhabit it together or uh, where there's just not, the, maybe those healthy spaces don't exist. Maybe it's something that's just endemic to gaming because gaming often attracts individuals uh, that are, um, I don't know, a little bit more socially isolated because oftentimes a gaming can be a proxy. I think it, that's not true across the board, but I think that does happen more often than not. Um, I'll say it's been a case for me where I've been socially isolated and uh, turned to gaming because of circumstances and things and I've turned to gaming to kind of alleviate that. But um, what I will say is, is the breakdown between men and women in that space, it's absolutely crushing positive movement forward uh, for all genders, for all genders, period, across the board. Uh, and that's again where I want to bring up the first book I recommended, which was James Hollis's book Under Saturn's Shadow for men. Women, I, I think uh, it's a decent read for women as well. I think you have to take a bit of what's said with a grain of salt because I think it is kind of locked into a certain time period, you know, specifically people that have grown up um, with the greatest generation as their parents. I would recommend equivalent books for women, but honestly, I feel like a lot of men would intentionally read them to be maliciously manipulative. 
which just shows the state of things, which is very frustrating to me. And I, I want to follow that up by saying, I wish I knew how to lead in this space. <clears throat> and I wish I could say fundamentally that I'm not part of the problem. Uh, but there are a lot of ways I feel like I'm the epitome of the problem. As much as uh, Jorb's book is a history of trauma, I think it's also confessional. And I want to say that, yeah, I'm also human too. Um, I make enormous mistakes with great fervor, and the people that know me well can attest to that. Um, I've also treated people as not human and lofted my trauma as though it was theirs to solve, which was incredibly unfair, and it's something I'm trying to work on daily, and I'm also trying to balance that out into being part of groups of people, being able to trust people and work through trauma collectively. I just, I haven't gotten to that stage yet, I'll say. I'm still working on it. It's a hard balance um, in relationship and, and community, but I'll... There are a number of things I don't think that are mine to say in that space, um, but there are a few that are, and these are kind of the ones I want to confess in particular. There's one in particular that uh, happened at the beginning of uh, <coughs> the branch into COVID. I had a friend who was female, and she has been in esports for quite some time, and she was trying to convey, I didn't see it at the time, but she was trying to convey a lot of the deep personal pain that she's experienced um, in esports. And I was a terrible listener, and I really let my personal issues that I was struggling with as a parent override what she was saying. And uh, I really made it about me, and I was just having toxic positivity and just being a shit listener. Excuse my language for, uh, oh well. Now there's cursing in this. Um, but I've already apologized to her, but I just want to... I want to be better in the future, but I also want to like make sure that people know, anybody, uh, that... Yeah, I think women in all of these spaces have had to deal with a lot. Um, workplace cultures here are very oftentimes toxic and exploitative, as I've already mentioned. And um, I will say that I've heard on more than one occasion uh, with different organizations where it seemed like the hiring practice was to hire attractive women and then driven men that had just gotten out of college or coming out of high school to create kind of a, that same sort of high school dynamic, honestly, that while it was very productive, you have all these men driving to impress these women, it was also extremely, extremely toxic and uh, traumatizing. And every time I heard a report from another individual about that from an environment, there was a lawsuit maybe a month or two later. So just be aware of that when you're in this space. Um, I don't know if that's done intentionally or if it's done organically, but I just feel like it's something that is very commonplace. And so I think it's something that anybody entering the industry needs to be aware of. Um, yeah, I, and I also want to like mention that earlier sort of energy. I don't know what to call it, where people go into a community. When you go into a Twitch channel, it's like you almost instantaneously know how to behave. I feel like you'll have a lot of individuals that they'll be put into these environments and either they'll remain silent or they'll start actively engaging in the bad behavior. And I think it's important that we stop and think about how we want to act now because there is that that thing inside of us that I think either wants approval or wants to be part of something bigger, wants whatever it is, that when we're in social spaces, we, we feel that drive to conform and to behave as everybody else is behaving. And I feel like that is oftentimes what allows the toxicity to be created and oftentimes what ends up sustaining it. Um, and I also want to say that like 99 times out of 100, those communities have been driven by men. And I don't know another way to put it. Um, I think in spaces more often than not when I've needed to speak out, maybe I haven't. I've tried to, but I don't know that I have. And I've, I want to be part of groups and communities that are creating not, uh, I feel like the, the opposite attempt has been done where it's like you create something and it's awkward for everybody and nobody feels comfortable. I don't think that's a solution either, but I want to be part of the solution to that. And I think it's something that we collectively need to tackle. Mostly because I love gaming and I love sharing things with people that I care about. I like having that collective excitement around a thing. So, and I feel like if people share that, if they're, I have this thing, I, I guess I'll call it reverse schadenfreude. I like it when good things happen to other people that I care about or think, or that I like. And I feel like a big aspect of that is, is I want to share things I'm passionate about. And it's just extremely frustrating, debilitatingly frustrating when I can't because of the toxicity 
and terribleness that's surrounded by it. Because then, yeah, people just won't be safe. Uh, and so I almost feel like if you care about whatever the core thing is, rather than treating it like, I think oftentimes it's like, ah, oh, this is my gem and I don't want anybody else to be a part of this. It should be something that we're excited about for multiple people to engage in and be part of so that it become, uh, can thrive and also transform and become new and see new expressions of things. One thing I do worry about in this era of Twitch is that as people start like copying one another, we're seeing a little bit less innovation as far as the cool new things that could happen. I digress there. <coughs> I don't know. I feel like there's still a lot of innovation happening in this space. I feel like it's the space for innovation right now. Um, I do want to talk about one space that we absolutely get right and one of the most infuriating sections of this book, which was uh, charity, charity in the gaming and uh, collective content creation space. Um, I ran a charity drive a while ago for Child's Play Charity and raised like a measly $1,300, something like that, $1,400. Um, and I primarily chose that charity because there was a time in my life where I was inside a minivan out in the cold. I couldn't afford gas, so I had to leave it off and it was cold outside. And so I was just like bundled up, writing numbers off the side of trailer trucks as they were driving by to make a cold call list for an oil company so I could earn money basically for Christmas so that I could blunt the trauma of uh, my mother's passing for my family um, as Christmas approached. And Child's Play Charity, they... Uh, they um, give presents to kids that are in hospitals on Christmas. And so it was a, an important thing to me. Um, and it's funny, running that charity drive, I believe first place is one of the higher ups in an esports organization at this stage. In the second place, I was actually more impressed by the second place finisher because I knew they were going to be have success in their life. And they actually, they're um, now have been very successful in one of these spaces, in the League of Legends space. Um, and have had like a, turnal, a total turnaround story, I think, as far as an individual. Um, that's an aside. Um, I'm curious if, they, if they'll get wind of this and remember any of that. But anyway, um, I'm getting off topic. Charity is something we do right, and I think it's something that, as a result, needs to be protected. And we need to keep it pure. Um, Jorbs has done a lot of charity drives. Uh, and I think they've been absolutely fantastic. I think it's created some trauma for him, which I think is extremely unfortunate because at least I'd love to see him take shots on other, at other things because I think he's good at it and I think he enjoys it. And I think it's one of the things that gives him a lot of joy. Um, but I think there's also an important thing to recognize a lot of the negativity that can, and also some of the things that might taint it. I will say that even running that drive initially, there was kind of this I noticed other people running other charity drives and I think it was, it's like, oh, this is for the content and so we can draw viewers in. And I think it's important to acknowledge that space just so we it doesn't end up tainting it, if that makes any sense. So it doesn't overshadow or, or introduce abuses into the con content creator space for charity. Uh, mostly because I feel like charity is one of the spaces where we can make a big impact in this world. Uh, in particular, um, I actually had this discussion with the, it came up in one of the Jorbs chats with climate change. I would love to see people take on climate change. Um, <clears throat> two thoughts and then I'll, I'll continue on that, that line of thought. Actually, I think charity might be important in particular because I feel like that might be the healthier vent of where, what, for whatever reason, content creators are looked or, or because of that innate drive to look for leadership or whatnot. And so this is, I think a really tangible way that content creators can point towards something uh, to make it better. And it's a good way to shield from that problem where we're treated, where content creators are treated as leaders, whether they're qualified or not. Jorbs is an expert in Slay the Spire. That doesn't make him an expert in, in uh, the political climate of Mali or wherever to be able to, but organizations like the water charity that he was donating to, they are experts in the political climate to be able to deliver water. For example, um, on that note, within the environmental impact one, <laughs> I ended up trying to look at solutions on the side myself uh, to help impact climate change. And I'll, I want to give the information that I learned there for people if they want to pick that up and run with it themselves. Um, something I learned in the process is I'm pretty sure this is correct, that basically 
oil. Like I've heard that oil, oh, it's dinosaurs that, you know, uh, rotted dinosaur bones or things like that. It's actually algae as far as I can tell. Historically, basically you had uh, ancient water reserves that had a lot of algae growing. They end up buried and superheated and you end up with oil. In fact, they don't call it oil now, but if you take algae and you superheat it, you end up with biofuel, AKA oil effectively. It's, it doesn't have exactly the same composition probably because it's happening at different temperatures and over different periods of time, but effectively it's, it's oil. Um, algae is also 400 times better than trees at absorbing carbon. And so I thought, ah, if I can just get a bunch of people to do carbon capture with algae, then that might solve our climate. And it's something we can fight back climate change. The problem is, is then after that, you need to sequester. You need to get rid of the algae. You need to put it in the ground. And uh, there's a lot of um, minerals, nitrogen, phosphorus. I'm not sure exactly what the chemical compositions are that people don't want just burying it. And I also don't know, this is kind of another thing that maybe some chemists can answer, because I don't know how much of those same chemicals we ended up releasing into the atmosphere as a result of burning all the oil we burned. So maybe it would be net zero if we did manage to figure out a way to bury the algae um, as a way to kind of offset um, some of the, the carbon footprint. I also thought about that as far as phytoplankton, because basically um, phytoplankton sea algae is what it comes down to. I thought maybe if we just dump it on the ocean surface, it'll eventually sink. And if not, it gets eaten by whales. Whales are great carbon capture, actually. Um, but uh, I will say that mass feeding whales is probably not the best solution. And I was able to get in touch with a marine biologist. And part of the problem with trying to do that is it ends up getting captured in particular la layers of the ocean. And um, it raises the acid uh, acidity. It doesn't end up carbon capturing at all. I will say that there are two solutions that uh, I kind of pause there. Actually, I had some people recommend that I actually maybe dive into more uh, space where we start mourning for the planet and coming to grips with uh, loss. I don't want to go to that space until we've taken all the shots we've taken, though. And um, I really want to see a pushback, especially with charity in this space and others. Uh, I want to see us push back against learned helplessness that seems to provi uh, pervade a lot of this generation. And I feel like Twitch and content creators and viewership can be leaders in that space where we aren't just engaging in learned helplessness. And we start trying to make moves and do things that are thoughtful and uh, make the world a better place. Uh, Bill Gates has an idea that he's been engaging in where he actually takes, uh, I think it's shale stone. If you tumble shale stone, for whatever reason it carbon captures. And so they want to take that and then uh, deposit that on the ocean floor. And there's also uh, efforts towards biochar. Um, and those might be promising as far as carbon capture to offset uh, carbon footprints. But I would love to see charity drives towards some of these efforts uh, to try to contribute to saving the world, basically. Um, kind of wrap it up there. I've gone a long time talking. In conclusion, I want to say that I'm probably an extremely biased, to be giving, uh, biased person to be giving this review because as I've mentioned previously, um, I have consumed Jorb's content and I like him as a person is what it comes down to. And there's kind of a weird, I think he's consumed some of my content. I don't know to what degree, but I think he has a warm familiarity with me as well. It's kind of this weird thing that happens again, also in this space where you see someone, you see them talking, you see them engaging. So you get a sense of who they are but you don't necessarily know them. You haven't engaged with them in person. And so there can oftentimes end up being that gap where you don't fully know the person. And, but in this instance, I almost feel like it goes both directions where I have a sense of Jorbs and he has a sense of me. Um, I'm not personal friends with him. Uh, and I'm not sure that I'm in a, I can't call him friend at the moment. We haven't had any lengthy interactions. And I don't even know if we could become friends because given time constraints and demands in both our lives, but I guess what I want to say at the end of the day is, is I really like Jorbs as a person and I think he's an important person in the world and I want to acknowledge him as an individual and I want to encourage everybody else to do the same, to treat him as human, um, primarily because I feel like he's had a positive impact on the Slay the Spire community. I think he's had a positive impact on the Twitch community. I think through this book, he is set to potentially have a positive impact as far as engaging in conversations in uh, the content creation and also being a good viewer and just in the world community, I think it can have a lot of uh, impact across the board, depending on how you want to apply it. But point being, yeah, I like the book. Um, I think it's a tough read at times, but it's an important read. And I think it asks us to engage in those questions uh, as stated by the title, before we go live and before we go live, can we stop and think and be thoughtful and look for ways to make the world a better place? Um, yeah, can we engage and step into a reflective mindset that he exudes and provokes. Um, I'm looking to do that more myself. <laughs> it's actually why I play Slay the Spire myself because uh, it helps 
deal my uh, helps curb my impulsivity a bit. But anyway, um, I hope you will enjoy the book. I'll leave a link to it in chat. Um, after you have read the book, I recommend if you're a content creator to go ahead and make your own review um, or post a review on Amazon, uh, as I hear that helps bolster visibility. Otherwise, I've been chatting forever been a long one, but hopefully you enjoyed or have some something stirred and enjoyed the chat overall. I do want to <coughs> say if you enjoy Slay the Spire, I have a couple recommendations. Check out Baylor Lord. Um, he's got a very cozy chat. Check out Jorbs. Uh, and I also want to say, I guess in the space of this, uh, thanks to Crimson Blur when he was streaming and hopefully he'll stream again because I very much enjoyed his channel as well in the space of all this. So I'll say with that exit, um, say thank you everybody. Um, Hope you enjoyed the rant slash review. Thank you for listening.